Thank you very much and good afternoon everybody. So yeah, my name is Kitty and I work um, over in Wales in the Cloud and VI Centre. And this afternoon I'm going to um, give you an overview of a case that I carried out earlier um, this year, back in the summer, that we were able to provide. So the initial presentation um, came to us in June of this year, and it was a phone call from a private vet in practice um, to us here at the VI Centre. So it was regarding a spring calving da dairy herd milking just over 300 cows, and they'd all calved in February, March of that year, and they were out, now out grazing. So the vet had been um, to farm on two consecutive days and had examined four adult cows. So two of these cows were already recumbent and had been noticed to be uneasy on their feet and had milk dropped the day before um, by the farmer and so had gone downhill quite quickly. One cow was moribund, so was put down and postmortem on farm by the vet. So we discussed these postmortems over the phone and they were fairly non-specific. The other cow that was recumbent had been treated with calcium and magnesium, but showed no response and then had died by the following day. The third cow was ataxic on the hind limbs and had a positive menace response initially, but had progressed to blindness by the following day. And the fourth cow was just showing more vague signs, low room in the fill, slightly unsteady on the feet, but had deteriorated quite rapidly over 24 hours and was also showing blindness and ataxia then by the following day. So we discussed the clinical signs and really the most consistent signs being shown by the two more acutely affected animals were blindness and ataxia. Uh, this photo here shows a cow that I examined myself later on in the investigation and she was in the late stage of disease. So as you can see, lateral recumbency, and she was unable to stand and had a negative menace response. And this cow was actually put down quite shortly after the photo was taken. So moving on to think about our differential diagnoses. So there's quite a right, wide range of diseases that can cause neurological signs in adult cattle, but blindness in itself is quite a specific sign. So I've just focused here on differentials that um, can cause blindness. So certain types of toxicity, in particular lead poisoning and clozantal toxicity. In this case, there wasn't any um, recent history of clozantal treatment, so we could rule that out of our differential list. Uh, CCN is also a cause of blindness in cattle. It's quite rare in adults, and we would more commonly see this in post-weaned calves. Um, Hypervitaminosis A, again, a cause of blindness, but we would consider this quite unlikely in animals that are at grazing. And then I've just put listeriosis as well. That rarely cause blind, causes blindness, but you can get an absent menace as a feature of um, listeral encephalitis. Um, so we sort of had it there in the back of our minds on the differential list. So sort of still discussing all of this with the vet over the phone, as Ed, Ed said, we're quite happy to take calls to discuss sort of cases um, with you guys out in practice. So I was just gathering a bit of further history like you would um, out in practice. So these cows were um, on quite a low input system. They were on daily paddock rotation, but were receiving some cake in the parlor, but quite a low volume of cake in total. The drinking water was supplied by uh, borehole and there had been previous issues with pika in the herd so cows eating stones um, but this year it was considered not to be as bad as it had been in previous years so the cows had received trace element bonuses at dry off and they also had access to rock salt in the collecting yard um, because of the history of pika so just uh, moving on then because lead poisoning was quite high on our differential list and we couldn't rule it out at this stage, this did raise some food safety concerns. So these are obviously milking cows. Um, and so this, this was a potential food safety incident. And 
as BIOs within OPHA, we will investigate these potential incidents on behalf of the Food Standards Agency. So I was able to discuss this with our toxicology expert within the APHA, who sort of explained uh, the clinical signs and um, the case so far. And it was decided that we should uh, notify this as a suspect lead poisoning to the FSA. So I then rang the farmer and informed him that he would have to notify his milk buyer and just warn them so that they could then put their own safety checks into place. And I also advised the vet um, to test for lead on the blood samples. So as the case progressed, uh, we received the blood lead results um, quite quickly within a couple of days, and they came back very low, consistent with background exposure only. So this meant we were able to rule out lead poisoning. However, there were more cows being affected and they were all showing quite similar signs of sort of milk drop, vaguely off colour and then quite quickly deteriorating, um, showing neurological signs and recumbency. And over about the first two weeks of the case, there was eight affected in total. And unfortunately, three of these died and five had to be put down because they were so severe. So during this time, we decided, right, we need to have some cows in for post-mortem. So we had three cows on separate occasions in to the VI centre. And we were able to offer our free, free carcass collection, um, as, as Ed spoke about in his talk, um, to be able to get these carcasses into the centre. And as part of the investigation, I also undertook a farm visit. So the vet and the farmer were both happy for me to go out and gather a bit more information. And I also shared um, the case so far with the cattle expert group. So this was just allowing me to get some opinions from um, experienced vets um, from all different sections of APHA. So the farm visit was a really good opportunity to gather further information. I was able to map the grazing fields where the cows had been and trying to look for any patterns relating to um, sort of appearance of clinical signs and, and where they've been grazing. However, because they were being moved so frequently, so every 24 hours they were in a new paddock, there was no real pattern that could be spotted. I did learn from the farmer that the borehole water um, that supplied the water troughs was stored in an underground metal tank. And when the water level was becoming low in this tank, the drinking water was becoming rusty coloured and it would remain rust coloured for around one to two days until they had a bit of rain and, and it would uh, the tank would top up again. Um, so that sort of raised some concerns and that was just a bit of useful information that, that I took from the visit. And it was also a good opportunity to have a really good walk of the fields, have a look at the hedgerows, looking at plants, having a look around the collecting yards. Um, sometimes just a new pair of eyes is useful, um, just trying to spot any sources of potential toxins. Um, but there was nothing really significant sort of jumping out at me. So just moving on to uh, one of the post-mortem exams that were carried out. So these pictures are from the first cow that we had in. So it was fairly non-specific findings um, on gross pathology, um, sort of hemorrhages throughout a few different areas of the, the body. Um, so this photo here on the left is the liver that's been sectioned. And you can see there there's sort of multifocal diffuse pinpoint purple hemorrhages throughout the tissue. The picture there in the middle is the abomasum with quite a nasty red brown watery contents and a handful of, of grit. So that really fitted with, with the history of pica in the herd. And then the photo on the right there, that's the lungs. And you can see there's quite marked hemorrhage there in the caudal lobe. So what we were then able to do was um, request a wide range of subsequent testing on the post-mortem tissues. Um, so this also included um, fixing 
a wide range of the viscera, um, including the brain, so that we could then process um, that histology. And another screening test that we could carry out in the VI center was um, examining the brains under UV light and checking for any autofluorescence. So this is a screening test for CCN. So if there's fluorescence there, then it's um, sort of a, a strong indication of CCN. But as Ed said in his talk, it, it doesn't um, give you a definitive diagnosis. But the brains here were, were sort of negative and they didn't show um, autofluorescence. So by, by this point, we, we were waiting for a lot of test results to come back and we were sort of getting them back in, in dribs and drabs and uh, sending out new reports to the vet as, as we went along. And um, nothing was really um, giving us a definitive di diagnosis yet. So we were sort of gathering, gathering all the results together. And then we received the histopathology results. And this did give us a diagnosis. So the morphological diagnosis on the brain was symmetrical cerebral cortical necrosis. And we did confirm CCN by histopathology in all three of the cows that we had submitted for postmortem. So just a note here, as I mentioned on the previous slide, the brains hadn't shown autofluorescence under UV light. So we know that that's a fairly unreliable test and and it just gives you an indication of, of if it's um, possible, but um, if it's negative, then it doesn't rule it out and you do need histopathology to diagnose CCN. So in ruminants, CCN is most commonly caused by a thiamine uh, deficiency, so vitamin B1, and that's most often following a dietary change. And the most common dietary change that we associate with this would be a carbohydrate overload. So this change in diet leads to proliferation of thymines producing bacteria within the rumen. And these bacteria then uh, release this enzyme which breaks down thiamine and you get reduced absorption. But CCN can also be caused by um, some other things. So consumption of certain plants, sulfate toxicity, uh, certain heavy metal um, toxicity and water deprivation. So we did advise that the borehole water should be tested and that came back uh, normal for sulfates. We'd ruled out heavy metal toxicity on uh, testing of the liver from the postmortem, and there was no history of water deprivation uh, in these cattle. So when we were thinking about the most likely trigger of CCN in this case, we did consider that it was most likely to be dietary related. There was no uh, history of a carbohydrate overload in these cows and they were on quite a low concentrate input. However, there had been quite poor grass growth in the spring and the sward length of, of grass was considered quite low. So it was surmised that um, Inadequate forage intakes in the herd had actually led to a secondary rumen dysfunction. And it was this dysfunction leading to um, a change in the microflora in the rumen and then uh, resulting in the thiamine deficiency. It was also considered possible that there was a change in the water constituents or even water consumption when the level in the borehole tank was becoming low. Um, so, with both of these sort of factors, there was no definitive way of proving either of these. And as often the case with CCN, you can't um, definitively sort of tell why it's occurred. Um, so really management is based on what's most likely to have triggered it. So we were able to give some recommendations. So you can treat um, acute cases of CCN with IV vit vitamin B1. And you do get favorable responses if the treatment is started early in, in the course of the disease. So the vets in this case had started to treat cows with B1 and um, sort of later on in the investigation. And they did get some, some successful um, results and some of the cows were able to re-enter the herd. And then recommendations um, going forward were based um, on the most likely factors that 
could have triggered CCN to develop in the first place. And so this was really based around um, supplementary forage feeding. So this was initiated and over the course of about two to three weeks, the number of cases did start to drop off and eventually um, stopped. And we also, also recommended um, ongoing monitoring of the borehole water at different um, times and also considering replacing that old water tank. So just to um, summarise the case then, so this really was an unusual outbreak um, of CCN. So it was unusual because it was in adult cattle. So how, how, as I'd said earlier, um, CCN is most commonly diagnosed in post weaned calves and it's quite rare to see it in adults. Um, and also the number of cows affected was quite high. Um, there was no sort of um, previous cases that had recorded this many cows being affected that I could find in the literature. Um, and it, so over about four to five weeks, there was uh, 20 cows affected and quite a high mortality rate. So it was a complex investigation um, involving input from a wide range of APHA colleagues. And also there was that investigation um, sort of on behalf of FSA towards the start of, of the case. So for this reason, it was really important that we had good communication between um, myself and the other vets in Carmarthen, and the private vets and the farmer, just to make sure that we were all engaged and were kept sort of up to date with the progress of, of the investigation. And also just interesting that the diagnosis did come down to histopathology in the end. So that just showed how important it was that we had the cows in for post-mortem exam so that we were able to get the brains out and uh, send them off to our pathologists in Wakebridge. So I'd just like to thank the private vets involved, uh, particularly Sarah at Phantom Vets and the farmer and my colleagues in Command and VI Centre and wider APHA. So thank you for listening and happy to take any questions.